Consider, consider the message. I understand the message. And we've heard most of this stuff in this past bill, so I will try to put a different spin on some of these arguments and maybe provide some new information for your consideration. And I really appreciate the committee members being open minded. I realize that all of us have long standing opinions on this issue of cannabis, and I'm asking you all to please suspend your prejudices and preconceived notions about this, and let's have an honest discussion about this. Um, we are only 20 people on this committee, but we're, we make laws and mandates that affect over a million people in this state, and that's a tall order and it's a very important piece of business that we're discussing today. So first of all, what this bill does, it simply removes the words cannabis and marijuana from section 318B of the RSA. That's the Controlled Drug Act. It leaves intact all the scary sub substances that cause a lot of harm, like heroin, prescription drugs, painkillers, and crack cocaine. But it also removes uh, the illegality of possessing so-called drug paraphernalia, such as pipes, bombs, and carburation tubes and masks, whatever those are. Uh, the way this bill is written, it's not very long, but section nine at the end of the bill is the best and most important part. That's where the good stuff is done. The other section previous to that are really sort of housekeeping to address other parts of the RSA that refer to cannabis indirectly. We want to talk about changing cultural values. We heard from some young people today, and I can see that on this committee, the average age is probably over 50, I'm guessing. So I remember when I was a kid, we had black and white TV, no, we didn't have any remote controls, we were watching Andy Griffith and Walter Concrete on TV. Some of you guys may remember that. So uh, if there was a telephone at all in the house, it was plugged to a line and it had a rotary dial on it. So just as uh, technology changes, so does the culture. People's mores, their hang-ups, what they consider to be decent behavior changes over time. When a lot of us were children, mixed race marriages and same sex marriages were inconceivable to many. So why are we stuck with a prohibition that's 80 years old on this issue? Most of you received this, I don't think you read it, but uh, the state legislative magazine, we got in our inbox, our mailbox here this past week. They refer to this, uh, they're talking about all the states that are legalizing marijuana or decriminalizing it. And they say the change in opinion about legalizing marijuana has followed a slow but steady course, rising from 12% in a 1969 Gallup poll to a record 50% in 2011. Generational differences in opinions about marijuana legalization reflect generational differences in its use. According to the 2011 National Survey on Drug Use and Health, most Americans between the ages of 12 and 60 have tried marijuana, while Americans, most Americans in their 60 or older have not. So, I don't smoke pot. This doesn't directly impact me, but as a taxpayer, as somebody who believes in civil liberties and humane treatment of our private citizens, this is a, a very important issue, and that's why I'm proud to sponsor this, ball, this bill. It's also, I think, okay to somewhat discount what uh, the spokesmen for law enforcement say about it. As uh, the school kids were here earlier can tell us, the separation of powers is one of the most fundamentals, fundamental cornerstones of our system of jurisprudence in our society. We are the legislative branch, we make the laws that everybody has to follow. The executive branch is simply there to enforce those laws. So let's represent the people, let's say the administration, the executive branch, 
uh, do what they do and enforce the laws that we make here in Concord. A cynic might say that the more things are illegal, the more job security for courts, law enforcement, jailers, and attorneys. Um, some might say, I would say, but some might say it's self-serving or a conflict of interest to continue to push, for them to continue to push to have things illegal. One of the most common opinions we hear in this committee on this particular issue is that federal government still considers cannabis a controlled substance. This is true, but who cares? Do you really think the feds are going to come crashing down your door, guns drawn, shooting your dogs, just for somebody smoking marijuana in the living room? No. The government, the federal government um, can't get out of its own way. They're, it's collapsing under its own weight. I'm not worried about the federal government. We've pushed back with real ID in the past. We can do it on this issue. We can be at the forefront of this important civil liberties issue. One more thing about the uh, economics of this. Just earlier this week, this committee heard a two-hour presentation from Chief Justice Meadow, the Department of Corrections, the Attorney General's office, about how we can let nonviolent criminals out of the prison system a little bit earlier, how treatment is more important than incarceration or punishment in some instances. But they didn't, that's just a band-aid approach to the actual problem. We have a chance here to strike at the root of the real issue, which is putting people in jail when they've harmed nobody, harmed not a soul. So uh, we haven't seen a fiscal note, but I can see that how this bill, or certainly the other ones we're hearing today, could save taxpayers the state millions of dollars. In, uh, and it would allow resources to be better used on either treatment, as some would prefer, or towards uh, prosecuting violent crim criminals, domestic violence, rape, murder, burglary, robbery, fraud, all those where they're truly victims. So that's, that's only one side of the uh, equation. The other side is the human element. Young men and women have their lives, lives turned upside down every day in this state because of prohibition. An arrest causes terrible stress on a person. It can cause him to lose his job, it can cause stress in his family, with his children, with his spouse, his or her spouse, I might add. Sometimes it leads to loss of employment. This is a double insult against somebody who is recreationally, recreationally smoking a plant. If prosecuted and found guilty, the person now carries a criminal record that haunts him for years and years. It could lead to denied work opportunities, added stress with the family, loss of educational scholarships, as we heard, and more. Think of the losses to productivity to our society because of these arrests. It's a horrible, inhumane way to punish somebody who hasn't harmed a soul. Punishment doesn't work. Let's focus, as a society, on compassion, tolerance, and um, compassion, tolerance, individual choice, and, in some cases, rehabilitation. The old model of putting people in jail and throwing away the key doesn't work. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Valentine. Thank you. As I understand your bill, it would simply put marijuana in the same category as liquor. It would be treated as liquor. Thank you for the question. Well, that's not the question. That's just the preface. But is, <laughs> is that, is that, was that your intent? No. No? No. That's the intent of your bill, uh, which I'm a co-sponsor, to really be more conscious. I'm not a fan of big regulation, so this is simply to remove it from the criminal statute. But to remove it the same way liquor is not a criminal, uh, considered a criminal thing. Uh, well, no, the same way that if you grow tomatoes or oregano or roses in your backyard and you want to consume them in your, in your house, it's, you know, it's not the government's business. Well, the purpose of my question was to compare marijuana to liquor. Because somebody earlier said that people on your side or my side were saying marijuana is a benign substance. I don't think anybody has said that. Isn't it, doesn't it come down to whether marijuana is more or less benign than alcohol? For example, my mother drank a fifth of gin a day and killed herself because of it. Might she not have been better off if she smoked a couple of joints a day instead of having drunk a fifth of liquor a day? Uh, I had that same issue with my mother. So I watched her die because of smoking cigarettes her entire life. 
a uh, legal product. It was very sad and painful to watch her. I don't smoke um, marijuana or tobacco or anything else. So um, I felt it's a matter of individual choice. Uh, though sad, uh, I don't want to limit people's ability to do themselves harm or good. But this has nothing to do with uh, their work control. Representative Ginsburg. Thank you, Madam Chair. Well, Representative, do you know anything about the numbers of arrests for marijuana possession use or dealing, uh, say, in the Hampshire? Yeah, I appreciate that question. I asked uh, Jeff Lyons, who's our liaison with the Department of Corrections, and he gave me a report that I can send to you all if you'd like. And it said that I think we have 2,700 people in the prison system. It said about 25 are currently there for um, charges that are mainly marijuana based mm -hmm. or all drug. You know, it, I'm sure it wasn't for possession, unless it's maybe a parole violation or a third time strike for possession, but typically it's for maybe distribution. Uh, I do not have the, the statistics on the county facilities or the jails or the police departments just making arrests. And I'd like to see that myself. Perhaps uh, one of the people coming up later can speak to that. And um, uh, we heard from an earlier uh, witness that the advantage of a bill like Representative Bouncer's bill that we heard earlier, uh, which would legalize um, and regulate, is that it would make the whole supply chain for marijuana legal and it would put illegal dealers out of business. Do you have any sort of response to that? First of all, that is a logical expectation of what would happen if that bill passed. But secondly, my bill would make it so they could just grow his own. I think that takes the criminal element out of it right there. And you had a question? Thank you, Madam Chair. Let's sort of follow up to Representative Ginsburg's question. Um, you mentioned a report that you could get. Yeah. Um, is it true that, that many people may be in jail or perhaps prison where they are not in specific marijuana charges, but marijuana charges have enhanced sentencing for other charges? Is that, is that, do you have any data on that? I think that's true, and somebody spoke to that earlier, one of the uh, prosecutors. One of the things I'm concerned about is this parole violation. We see a lot of people going back to jail because they violated their terms of parole, which often includes smoking pot. Yeah. Any other questions? I just need to try again because if you go to line 14 and 15 on page 1 of your bill, it does in fact put marijuana in with a line that says distilled spirits, wine, malt, beverages. What is, the per what is that section? Isn't that removing it from that section? Controlled drug act, scheduling by commissioner. Authority to control under this section shall not extend to distilled spirits, wine, malt beverages, marijuana, or tobacco. But yeah, well, I, I guess this is a bunch of sections that have been thrown in here together. Right. Tell me the line again. 14 and 15 on page 1 of the bill. Yeah, that's good. That's saying that uh, under that uh, under that section 318, that uh, people cannot control marijuana. Along the same way, that, I think that has to do with control drugs are not handled by the people who do um, distill spirit. Right, the Liquor Control Commission controls distilled spirits, small beverages. Mm -hmm. And right now, the um, in, under the Control Drug Act, it's a different commissioner. So this is just, it's really a housekeeping thing. Uh, right. It doesn't add to the liquor control requirements at all. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, Dennis Krogan. Mm -hmm. Thank you.